Good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'm going to be introducing our host until Brahma is ready to moderate. The first thing I'd like to let you guys know is just a brief reminder of the rules. And uh, there, there are only two of them. One is the first one, and most of you know that, and that's one fool at a time. The second rule is no personal attacks. Ooh. The, format, the format of the college starts off with a brief announcements period. We will then have a, our speaker presenting. Then we will have a brief question period. After the question period, we'll have our infamous rebuttal period where each of you will get a certain time to spout off. Mariam Jadar is... Uh, an attorney. Uh, she practices uh, law for the community uh, uh, the citizen advocacy center and uh, she's uh, the power behind the PowerPoint uh, demonstration here uh, that she's giving tonight. Uh, she's talking about the democracy movements in Egypt and in Morocco of all places. Yes. And uh, she's back from a visit arranged uh, through the U.S. Department of State uh, Legislative Department of State Legislative Fellows Program. Uh, um, state legislators. Uh, well, anyway, she's been there a couple of weeks, and uh, her name is. Uh, of uh, Arabic for Mary. I don't know why uh, uh, she's called his uh, in this uh, announcement, but but uh, then uh, Mary has a lot of uh, supporters, both uh, Christian and Muslim, and of course it comes from Miriam, which is Hebrew. Okay. Uh, all right, let's do it. All right, thank you so much for inviting me, Charles, for reaching out to Citizen Advocacy Center. I want to indulge you all, if you'll indulge me, um, indulge me to explain to you what we do at Citizen Advocacy Center and why I'm here talking about this subject. So Citizen Advocacy Center is a nonprofit, nonpartisan, community-based, grassroots legal organization. We're located in Elmhurst. Um, as a legal organization, we assist folks, and as a nonprofit organization, we assist folks uh, for free. Our mission is um, uh, to build democracy in the 21st century. So our assistance is around helping people with the, the legal assistance that they might need to be active in their communities to organize around problems that they've identified that they want to forge solutions for, um, as well as um, just a community organizing assistance. And that's why I'm a community lawyer. So I do the traditional lawyering as well as the community organizing. Our organization, in addition to helping people in the state of Illinois, with these kinds of issues, civic issues. Um, we also do a lot of civic education. So we have a civic empowerment zone. We have a lot of free lesson plans for teachers around any, a lot of different topics under the um, big umbrella of democracy. Lots of um, informational brochures on relevant topics that people might not know very much about that are affecting them in their local governments or at their state or government level. And we host several legal interns, college students, high school students every summer to equip them with the tools um, and the, the tools that they can then turn around and use to build other people's capacity in becoming active in um, the government decision-making process and in the democratic process. We do all of our work funnels into what we um, do on the state level, so our grassroots level work informs our policy advocacy. Um, so we do try to affect legislation that affect the tools and institutions that support government decision making, I mean, support public participation in the government decision making process. So that means, you know, we're trying to make sure that the Open Meetings Act is strong, the Freedom of Information Act is strong, 
trying to reform the election code to um, make our elections more accessible for folks who want, who want to run in, in elections as well as for voters. Um, and obviously, first, the First Amendment, the five freedoms of the First Amendment are very palpable in the work that we do. We're often defending people um, from government infringement on their free speech rights. And as lawyers, we also have a tool to turn to litigation when necessary. We don't like to go to litigation because it's really expensive and usually you can forge a solution prior to that. Um, so, but it's a tool that we have used successfully and has um, helped us uh, gain the credibility that we need to accept reform in the state. All right, so part of our internship program includes interning and hosting uh, people from abroad. So this program that I'm going to talk to you about today, wherein I was lucky enough to go to Egypt and Morocco and visit with dozens of nonprofit organizations, government organizations, religious institutions to talk about what's happening over there in this really critical time. Um, uh, it was made possible through a local nonprofit in Chicago called Citizen Bridges International. They were not formally called Heartland International. Um, and I'm not sure if they exist right now because they're having funding street problems, but um, when we went in January, they had they they had already hosted, they had already applied for grants to the U.S. State Department to bring people from Morocco and Egypt who worked in democracy <laughs> and who also worked doing just rights work, whether it's disability rights, women's rights, children's rights in their countries, and they paired those individuals who had to apply through the U.S. Embassy to be approved to be as part, part of this program, they were able then to come to the United States to visit Chicago and have not only homestays, but also they um, had internships, more or less, for um, three weeks or four weeks at sister institutions, let's say, in Chicago. Um, so our so actually we had two different interns from Egypt that interned with Citizen Advocacy Center. Our first was Sharif Allah, and he came in 2011, early 2011, and he worked at a uh, democracy-based organization. And he came to visit us right on the verge of when Egypt was about to oh, get Mubarak out of office. So they had already had the revolution. It had been a year, in, you know, where there was a lot of activity, and he was involved in the revolution. Like he was actually at Tahrir Square, leading chants in the square. And we were lucky enough to see a YouTube video of him doing that. It was amazing to see the the crowd in front of him while he was leading a chant, the camera kind of over him. Um, so he came to visit us. He went out to visit high schools in the DuPage area where he shared what it's like living in Egypt in, you know, in a time of change and being in the midst of a revolution, as some like to call it. Um, others refer to it as a, um, not so much of a revolution, but an uprising, and we'll talk about that. Um, and our second intern, her name was Asma Goda, and she worked at a democracy a rights institution in right outside of Cairo, and she came to visit us in 2012, in October of 2012, and she did very similar activities with us as Sharif did. So we made sure that they were able to meet with government leaders in Illinois, whether the local, county, state government leaders. We made sure that they were able to meet with people in different institutions like law enforcement agencies and other agencies so that they could learn a little bit about how things operate here and make comparisons and contrasts with hey, back home and learn about programs. And um, uh, so we made sure that they both had a very robust time here. And Ella also went out to schools and talked about her 
relationship with this uprising and revolution movement in Egypt. And because she's female, hers is a little bit different than Sharif. She was not in the middle of Tahrir Square leading chants. She was at home with her parents you know, watching it on television. Um, so it was interesting to kind of contra compare and contrast their experiences. Um, but it was with Asma's program that I was able to go to Egypt and visit with her as well as all the other programs that participated. And that's where I'm going to start telling you about um, what the themes, the um, tensions and other obstacles that I was able to kind of coalesce in my mind is you know, what's happening in the Mideast with these emerging democracies. All right, so the overall themes. First of all, one thing that was very palpable is that, oops, is that we have a shared struggle. So within this framework of this common human rights language that this inter the international community is really veering um, towards talking about our involvement abroad and framing it as human rights, which to me was really different. I have a degree in uh, public health, and I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Madagascar, and I'd been in that world of international development, and back then, human, the, the term human rights wasn't bandied about as, as much. So that was really interesting to me to hear that human rights was uh, this framework that our, our government was really pursuing these programs in these countries. And um, so our, one of our shared, shared struggles is balancing human rights against government inter intervention with our rights, right? So that's something we're all facing, whether we're Americans or Egyptians or Moroccans or Tunisians or anywhere that people are battling their governments. What are some special tensions that they're facing over there? Well, changing gender roles. So uh, fortunately, a lot of the youth, or maybe not so fortunately, that I work with at the center, the, the female youth, they, um, I find that they take it for granted that the activities that they get to engage in these days, like you know, my friend Heidi's daughter, don't even say she takes it for granted that she's free as a female. But it wasn't always like that in our country even. So what, in the 40s, women were empowered to leave the home because you know, World War II required that we needed more folks out in the workforce and there was a backlash against that in the 50s and and we had the uh, feminist revolution and the you know, sexual revolution. That hasn't happened over there yet. And there are a lot of gender roles, the tensions with these changing gender roles. So, and they're changing. So women are going out and working in these countries, and that wasn't the norm prior. Um, they're having discussions about women who have children out of wedlock. So the kinds of discussions that our country we are still having those kinds of discussions, but they were more taboo, let's say, 60 years ago and before that. Another tension that we'll talk probably at length about is the religious versus the secular nature of these countries. You know, one of the, I would say, the main uh, the main part of our Constitution that kind of gels it all together is our First Amendment those five freedoms in our First Amendment, and separation of church and state, which is controversial. You know, we've got a provision in, Ob in Obamacare or Affordable, Affordable Health Care Act, right, whichever you'd like to call it. Um, uh, you know, that's being scrutinized by our courts to see if it indeed uh, transverse uh, uh, transverse of the line. So, you know, it's, it's still an issue in our country too, but in those countries, they just don't have the same experiment that our country has. So when, when our forefathers decided to establish our constitution and they were appalled by members of residents in this country, you know, uh, newly, uh, newly arrived Europeans in this country who were being jailed for their beliefs, so like Thomas Jefferson seeing a Baptist minister preaching from a jailhouse through the windows with an audience right outside the jailhouse, 
he was appalled that someone could be imprisoned because of what's in their mind. Um, and we had a lot of diversity, I suppose, more so than the countries in the Mideast have at the, at the moment, even back then. I mean, obviously now our country is much more diverse, but back then, that context really informed our separation of church principles and our, our freedom of religion. And the conversations I had with people in these countries is that they don't really see how to tease those two apart. And that's going to be a humongous challenge that we'll talk about. So that's another tension. Another tension is we talked a little bit about human rights and this language of human rights. Well, human rights, talking about human rights, what's the tangible outcome of talking about human rights? So these programs that are being implemented abroad to talk about human rights and to empower illiterate people through this common language of human rights is great, but from the perspective of the recipients, some of them are asking, where are the tangible outcomes? Where's the economic development? Where is the shelter and the housing and just tangible things? Other obstacles. Uh, distrust of foreign funding. Egypt apparently is famous compared to all these other countries in the Mideast for being very distrustful of foreign funding. So, um, the Gallup poll that came out in 2012 that summarized Arab attitudes in the Mideast emphasized this as well. So it wasn't just something I was hearing. I was thinking, well, is it just Egyptians who are wary of foreign funding? But apparently Egyptians are unique, even in the Mideast, for their um, distrust of foreign funding. And that became, that was something that we discussed while I was over there. Well, okay, so. Seems they don't like imperialism. Yeah, so. They, so the people I spoke with would say there's an agenda attached to foreign funding. And so they're, they're very suspicious and they're skeptical about these foreign funds and the programs that they fund. Although it depends on, you know, right now the World Bank and the USAID are spending a lot over there to do a lot of women's programs and programs for youth, especially in the arena of human rights and health. And um, and those seem to be accepted for some reason. Uh, they those have some, I guess, um, credibility. And there's German programs. So we'll, I haven't advanced the uh, PowerPoint very much, but I'll, um, we'll be talking about Anwar Sadat's organization. That's the nephew of the Anwar Sadat who's assassinated. So here's Anwar Sadat. Um, nephew, he runs the El Sadat Association. His office is in a area of Cairo that's a new area. It's only a hundred years old. The rest of Cairo is kind of crumbly, and we'll, we'll see some pictures of it. Um, and he started this NGO that does a lot of civic education. So one of our Egyptian interns, um, the second one, the female Asma. She actually works for this organization, but she works at one of the satellite offices in the suburbs of Egypt. And they do a lot of really great work with youth in their communities to talk about lots of different problems that their programs, that their um, communities are facing and taking action. Um, Malika in the green, she's actually American grew up in New Jersey, but she's Egyptian. She moved to Egypt about a year ago, and she works with this organization. And she was um, indispensable during our visit there. Here she is, we loved her. So this is Tahrir Lounge, Nile Delta. That is where um, Asma worked. And these are some of the folks that she worked with. And these are paid, people who are paid to do civic education, essentially, uh, and human rights empowerment in the suburbs of Cairo. Um, and here are some youth who have programs 
in that area doing, like raising money, you know, helping to implement programs, like act, actually logistically implementing programs. Um, taught, you know, these two ladies, well, this lady here, she's actually a identical twin. Her identical twin didn't stand up with her, but they run a program to help families and children and parents um, get, you know, get along a little bit better. So a lot of kind of unique programs. Um, and this is outside of that Nile Delta Tapir Lounge. I mean, this is, it's not paid. So um, this, is the, this is the town that Anwar Sadat is from. So Anwar Sadat, who was assassinated, and his nephew, they hail from this area. And, um, and everyone loves Anwar Sadat over there because they just, they just really love him. There's a museum for him over there. And um, we visited the museum. And um, well, so you see, this is the kind of this is the these are the vehicles in the, in the neighborhood. This is right across the way from that office. And you can see folks are wearing um, Western clothes and you know pretty modern, but a lot of guys out in the streets, not many women. Okay, so top here. Uh, Tapir Square. So, um, what do I want to tell you about Tapir Square? So this is right before the anniversary of the revolution. So this is right before the second anniversary. So it's January 23rd, maybe, January 22nd of, of this year. And it was nighttime and we walked around the square and um, it was, you know, a lot of tent cities. I think I have a picture of, like here you can see in the middle of the square, behind those signs, there's a lot of tent cities and people are mulling back and forth. And um, it was pretty calm. Uh, you know, the reason why the U.S. the U.S. Embassy there asked us to leave on January 19th for, on the trip where our Moroccan counterparts that went straight to Morocco left a little bit later because they were kind of worried about what was going to happen on the anniversary day and they didn't want us arriving on January 25th. So we were fortunate that they planned the trip before the 25th and not afterwards because I don't think that we would have gone if it was afterwards because of course you may have heard there were a lot of protests at the um, anniversary of the, the uprising of the revolution. So, you know, I just don't want to spend too much time on these pictures except to say a little bit more to develop some of these themes that I was talking to you about. So changing gender roles, this woman here, she was one of the legislative fellows. She's running a program, she's a board member of a program called Together for Development in Egypt. She does a lot of organizing women in her community to talk about human rights, health rights particularly. So women's rights, but particularly health rights. And one of the issues that she's dealing with and that they've implemented change with is women in Egypt, in the absence of their um, husbands being around, they just don't have access to health care. And if their husband, like let's say, works abroad or works elsewhere in the country, it, it, it's a barrier to the woman getting health care, and these women are considered single women. So they made a they advocated for a change in the law that single women could have access to health care because these the women who are identified as single through this, I mean they're essentially raising their families alone, even if their husbands might be sending them some money from where they're staying at. Um, they're essentially, you know, scraping by. They don't have access to health care. They got to get their kids to school, get their kids fed. So we asked her, well, does single women also include women who give birth out of wedlock? Which here, you know, that was a taboo subject, and maybe now it's a little bit touchy. I don't know. You all can tell me what you think. Yeah. Okay, not so much. Not anymore. Yeah. Nah. Not anymore. And, but over there, I mean, there isn't really a language for it. Because that, that was not what single women means in that law. Single woman doesn't mean women who give birth out of wedlock. 
And that's just remember that because when, when I talk about Morocco, it's going to come up again. Um, this program is funded by World Bank and I think USAID. And you'll see there's some other board. So this is Asma. She came. She was the one who visited us and stayed with us at the center. Um, everyone else is a someone who works in Chicago doing work like their counterpart did. So one of the women, she works as a lawyer at the um, Shriver Center for National uh, Poverty, Center for Poverty Law. We have a legislator for a uh, state senator and um, other folks that were with us. So these folks here are board members of Together for Development in Egypt. Now this area that we're in is in Luxor. So let's look at the map of um, Egypt, just so you can see. So we, we basically, we escaped Cairo, we escaped um, uh, Tahrir Square, even though you know, we weren't staying in Tahrir Square, where the, where the US Embassy is, where the Egyptian Museum is, and there's a lot going on there. We were staying in Heliopolis, which is where El Sadat Association's organization was. Um, so, it, it, oh here, okay. So here's Luxor. So it was about like an hour flight from Cairo down to Luxor. And so down here, farms as far as the eye can see, sugar cane as far as the eye can see, much smaller population. There was a there was a parade that came through Luxor the night that we were there. There's probably an easier way to do this, but the night that we were there, a small um, parade came through to um, celebrate the anniversary, but it was much more tame than what was happening in Tahrir Square. Oh, here, this fellow here, he's a legislative aide to Anwar Sadat, who runs that organization. Anwar Sadat is also the head of the Reform and Development Party in Egypt, and so he, to the extent that the government is operational there right now, he, um, He's like a legislator, and um, and his son is his legislative aide, and his son put together this really wonderful. I wish I could read it. Explanation of the 63-page constitution that Egypt, or that you know, basically um, Morsi and the, the Muslim Brotherhood wrote. It's in Arabic. I can't read it. I don't have a translation of it, but. Um, I should, I know, I want to get a trap But, um, so it was interesting. So, so, um, uh, you know, the Muslim Brotherhood basically kept everyone out of the loop when they wrote this constitution. And I really draw a lot of parallels in the way that they passed this constitution with the way that we passed the USA Patriot Act. Because, they hardly gave anyone a chance to even read the 63 pages, and they had a referendum on the ballot, and people overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly voted it in. The Muslim Brotherhood is just very, very influential. And you might want to take note, they were not a political group before. The Muslim Brotherhood was not a political, they didn't have a political identity to the extent that they do now. <laughs> Well, Since even the Egyptians. Well, that's why I don't know if you um. So there were uh, there was a piece in Frontline talking about uh, the 15 folks, the 15 youth from very disparate parts, uh, disparate uh, political beliefs and ideological beliefs in Egypt, who had a tent in Tahrir Square, and it was called the Green Tent because their tent was green. And this fellow from Frontline went you know, two years later to go and visit these 15 individuals who were very organized in their one intent, which was to get rid of Mubarak. But as the article points out, they didn't, they weren't organized in thinking about what they wanted after Mubarak. And two of the individuals who were part of this 15 were members of the Muslim Brotherhood. And, um, and they bemoaned the fact that Morsi won the presidency. They were they were disavowing their uh, 
affiliation with the Muslim Brotherhood because they themselves said it's not a political entity. You are a social, a cultural entity. All of you know the po the reason why they had so much power is because of the trust that they garnered from doing all the good work that they did around the country, which was basically giving people giving children school supplies and making sure people had food and necessities in the rural areas and they're loved. And that's why they won. And they and, and as we're seeing, I think they're not politically savvy. Um, and they and you know, and one thing that worries me is the to the extent that countries that would like to see more religious um, republics, like Iran, <laughs> that worries me, the influence that Iran might have over um, the unsophisticated uh, re uh, regime of Morrissey, basically. Um, so, what else do I want to share with you? So let's move on to some of these other folks so we can get, I could get to Morocco and do some comparisons and contra contrasts. Oh, this is another organization near Luxor that um, does a lot of work with women microfinancing. This is the microfinancing department. These women give out, uh, their goal is to give out like 150 grants. So to 150 women, but I think they were able to reach like 1,500 women and they were doing really well. And um, she's demonstrating the receipt that they print out for the women. The women pay back the grants that they got. Um, they're, they're expected to pay it back. You know, in, in Islam, there's no concept. It's well, there is a concept of um, interest, but it's forbidden. But programs like this are able to collect interest to cover their costs. So that's um, you know, that was I guess one obstacle that a program like this faced in being implemented in Egypt, but they were able to convince folks that it was worth the while, and it's been, it's been very successful. All these adorable little kids that are waiting for us outside of the, the center, they're, they're adorable. And here we have a guy, he works at the center, and that's his dad, and, and that's his son, and they were just so happy to see us, and everyone came to say goodbye, and it was fun. And here we have all the sugarcane fields. I mean, imagine that. Miles and miles of sugarcane fields. Um, homes with a lot of rebar so that you know people will build, as soon as they have enough money to build another floor on their home, they got the rebar ready to go. That's all over the countryside. OK, so this is the party or celebration or protest, if you will, that was happening in Luxor, right near the hotel that we were staying at. Luxor is where all the um, Egyptian, yeah, where all the tourists go. It's where all the big um, touristy spots are. Valley of the Kings, Valley of the Queens. You got Luxor Temple, Temple of Karnak. Um, this is actually uh, Temple of Luxor, and folks are gathering slowly. A lot of horse-drawn carts in Luxor. Tourism there has plummeted when we were there. All these horse-drawn carts that are a staple of tourist activity in Luxor, they were idle. 85% of them were idle. The, um, the boats on the Nile, 85% of them were idle. People were really, really hurting. They had the truck out with the stereo, and people were you know, getting ready to have their march at night. And so I took this from my balcony. It was a really small march. Kind of interesting to see a cross in that picture. Kind of bizarre to see that. Not that there aren't churches there, but for it to be so uh, right there. Um, so everyone's marching and they're chanting that they're chanting basically that they want the freedoms that were promised to them. And just for fun, you know, oh, there's Asma and I at um, the Temple of Luxor. So here we have a school administration meeting in the province or governorate of Monafia, which is where Anwar Sadat is from and where Asma's from. And Asma brought me to this school administration meeting 
and there were a lot of students there who were talking about what they wanted from the, um, their schools. So they were actually hearing out the students. It was kind of neat to see because you know that's something that we grapple with a lot at the center when we're trying to um, work with students when they find un anti-democratic practices happening at their schools. We you know obviously hit a lot of um, butt heads with the school administration. So it was kind of neat to see that um, they were involving the students. And their decisions. Here's a student talking. He was like the head of the student union, 18 year old. No, he's like the only male student in the room because all the women, all the girls, don't have many activities available to them like the guys. The guy is there because he's the he's the president of the student union. But the women, the girls in the school, like this is their way of not having to go home. So she was really active in, the, um, in talking about the problems that the school's facing. And I asked them, I said, what have you guys learned about your new constitution at school? And neither of them had had any instruction about their new constitution at school. But the, the, the man, that the, the, the male student, shared that he had read it on his own and that he had some questions about some of the provisions and that he didn't agree with them. And that um, the woman in the pink, the girl in the pink, she said that she read the Constitution and she went and talked about it with her teacher. And they had a little discussion about the Constitution. So I was interested in, to know what they were learning about their government, but their government, but they were much more focused on the fact that some of their teachers were tutoring children outside of school hours and getting extra money for that, and they were supplying those students with extra textbooks that not the other students got. So those are the kind of concerns that they were more worried about. Garbage. Oh my goodness. I was, guess I was so excited to see garbage all in one spot as opposed to all over town. Um, they're having a big garbage problem. Um, here's a sign that's tells you where top here lounge is, Nile Delta is on the right. So they have a really strong presence, so that was nice to see that this organization that allows for youth to gather and talk about problems and forge solutions um, has a really strong presence in this area. So here we have, this is Tanta, and Tanta is another governorate. Next to Mauna Fia, the governorate is called, um, I, I don't know what it's called. But this building over here, I was told, was burnt down during the revolution. And the, the, the conspiracy story around that was that someone, that folks who had done like some embezzlement or something in that building was an opportunity to hide it by burning it down. I don't know what the real story is. The reason we took this picture is because of this handicap Picard. Um, you know, folks in Egypt and Morocco don't have the same kind of rights that people with disabilities here in our country do. And I, we were so, I was surprised, she was surprised <laughs> to see a handicap placard. And so we took a picture of it. Ah, sugar cane. It's so delicious. And we were drinking it. And it's fro- oh, it's so good. It's yummy. It's not that sweet either. It's very... You don't like it? You don't like it? This is Tahir Lounge. Uh, I have to take a picture of it. No, I'm just proud of them over there, what they're doing in Tahir Lounge. And this is their office in Tahir Square. Cairo Institute for Human Rights Studies. So one of the things that is happening over there uh, with the new um, Morsi's administration is that they are definitely not adopting the kinds of democratic freedoms that the protesters in Tahrir Square were hoping for. Um, and for example, uh, Cairo Institute for Human Rights Studies and other non-governmental agencies in Egypt were fighting against repeated attempts by the government to institute laws that would restrict the work of non-governmental organizations. So. In other words, the government wanted to have a st uh, the powers to dissolve the organization if it wanted to, to decide who would be a board member of those nonprofit organizations, to fire staff people of those organizations. And um, this organization, which is mostly a research institution, not just about Egypt, but about a lot of different um, Arab countries, um, 
they were doing more advocacy in this in this um, new climate. And so we got to visit with them, and and let me show you the the view from their balcony. So this is Cairo. I thought it was a pretty good good shot to kind of see what it looks like. You can you can tell it's dingy looking. This is not a particularly sunny day. Um, a view straight on and the view from the, the the right of the balcony and we decided to just focus in a little bit so if you look down here you can kind of see there's on top of this really tall building there's it looks like someone's living there and like look at all the trash I mean that was Cairo everywhere I mean you walked into a building and you went up the, the stairwell and you or the elevator and you went to a floor and it was just that's what it looked like it was shocking to me that the infrastructure is just, it's crumbly. It looks really crumbly. What? Disarray. Yeah, a lot of disarray. So third world country? That's why they're in this way. Yeah, well, it's ancient. So, you know, I, you know, I don't know, some of these buildings, I don't know how long they've been up, but they're, they're just not. But I mean, we saw what happened in, was it Bangladesh? Bangladesh. With the, you know, with the, um, the, uh, the factory for the, but, uh, so I don't know. Okay, so we got to see the whirling. So I'm just showing you that we had to, we got to do some fun things too. So these are the, um, the not the whirling dervishes, but the Sufi dancing. Men dancing. You know, of course, women. You don't see women performing. So uh, we got to go up to the. The uh, Giza to the temple, temp, uh, pyramids of Giza, and this is kind of a neat shot to see like Western wear. You got the camel, and you have kind of crumbly Cairo in the background. All right, so we left Cairo. We took a six-hour flight to get to Morocco. I had no idea it was that far away. So this spans, I think, the span here is more than the United States. No. No. Okay, yeah, say so. It took six hours to get there. So, we went to Rabat, we went to Casablanca, and what I want to share with you, so this is this mosque. So this mosque in Casablanca was built 20 years ago. And it was built for the former king. So the current king is the son of the king that this mosque was built for. They spent, I don't know, like 600 million euro on this mosque, and it's like it's spectacular. The Egyptians were shocked to see it. They were shocked to see just the, because, oh, when we went to Morocco, the Egyptian legislative fellows got to come and visit with them, so that's kind of neat. And the Egyptians and the Moroccans had to have, they got to have this unique opportunity to learn from each other, because they, they actually speak different dialects and they couldn't understand one another and it was interesting for them to see what's happening in each other's countries. So the Egyptians that were with us were shocked by this uh, this um, mosque that was so extravagant. It had a hammam, like a, a the, ba the bathing, you know, the traditional bathing downstairs that no one used because it wasn't tip for use, it was just for show. And all the Egyptians were whispering, saying, why are they putting a hammam in a mosque? That's not where it's supposed to be. But the guy was telling us that they built it because it shows the culture and the history of Morocco. So anyhow, remember that mosque, because we're going to see something else that will shock you. Um, this woman, amazing woman, Aina Chenna, she works at an organization in Morocco. She became involved with working with women who bear children out of wedlock in 1985 or something when she was having a child in the hospital. She told this really moving story about she watched another woman breastfeeding her child and the authorities came and pulled the child from the woman's breast and the baby was crying and the milk was spurting and by law, women who had a child out of wedlock, like they, the kids had to be separated from them and sent to an orphanage. So she promised then that she was going to change this because she was appalled. Because she had just had her own baby and she was like really emotional and really feeling for the woman and the, the baby. And this was during the bullet years. So when the former king was in power, he did what most of 
what, what a lot of dictators do. So like what we saw like Mubarak did, did and what the Shah did, and you know he disappeared people. He disappeared people who didn't um, agree with him, and. Um, and during those bullet years, she spoke out about injustices, and she received death threats, and um, and she persevered, and she won an Opus Award from a religious, an American religious foundation, it was like a million dollars for the work that she did, because she basically took two hundred dollars and turned it into this big um, organization that helped a lot of women and changed the laws there. She reformed the laws in Morocco so that they no longer treat. Aina Chenna, A I N N A, Chenna, C H E N N A. And she won an Opus Award. So, um, and basically, the million dollars were given to them so they could purchase this 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 office so that they have they're sustainable. And um, and so so uh, the women who were visiting. So here's a lawyer who helps make sure that the women get a fair shake when they have they bear children out of wedlock. They're also working on making to to secure that the fathers give child support. I mean that's just a weird idea over there that they're just right now starting to educate people about and to try to influence the laws so that the fathers are more involved. Not just the child support. They're interested in making sure the fathers are involved in the children's lives. So these um, Egyptian women <laughs> who work doing rights in Egypt were so interested to talk to Aina because Morocco kind of is 10 years ahead of Egypt. So the movements in Morocco and Egypt were very different. Morocco it was the February 20th movement. It was very, um, you know, what I learned in Morocco was very almost orchestrated or just really, um, not orchestrated, but just, uh, I want to say um, sanitary. It was sanitary. There was no violence. And what happened, according to the um, the scholars that we met with, folks who were, who were you know professors at universities, you know, they explained to us how the monarchy there is very savvy, and they co-opted the movement, borrowing the language that the youth were using, and meeting demands, compromising demands, doing what they felt comfortable with, and. You know, there's the status quo right in there. There isn't to the satisfaction of all the Moroccans. Just as in in Egypt right now, people are very bitter that things didn't go the way that they had hoped. So they were interested to talk to Aina just about, you know, how did you institute this reform in Egypt? Because if you remember earlier, when we, we noticed the other woman um, who does women's rights work in her area, she mentioned that they don't have a definition. Under single woman, the children who bear uh, children under wedlock is not included under that. So that was a really neat exchange, I thought. Out of wedlock. So this is another woman who does a lot of women's rights in Morocco at a different organization. This guy led, he was a member of the Truth and Reconciliation Committee when, after the bullet years, people were able to talk about the abuse that they suffered under the hands of. Um, uh, King Hassan, and now he is, uh, um, he works in the government and he works at the Ministry of, I want to say like the local development or something of the counterpart of that, or no, I'm sorry, it's the Ministry of Human Rights. So a newly implemented Ministry of Human Rights in Morocco. This is Bukhar, Ma, Bukhar Mazuz, he started about 30 years ago, a sister cities program with Casablanca in Chicago, and it's really through him that all these visits in Casablanca and Rabat were made possible, and he's a hero, a local hero there, and you'll see why. A uh, religious um, scholar who was very progressive, he um, talked to us a little bit about, you know, some of us criticized him for speaking in platitudes, but his platitudes were very beautiful on um, the way he phrased things. He, met, he did mention that he was part of the, the first mission to the UN DP of, of Muslim scholars that like want, wanted to um, talk about AIDS and HIV in their, in their community. So very kind of more, more progressive um, religious scholar.
he said, if rigidity does not ensure happiness, there's something wrong, and then you need to revisit your modes of understanding and dialogue with the text. This is through a, all of this was kind of, like, most of this um, visit was through translators, and I tried to be, capture their words as much as I could. To, but you know, through the translator, there's already this you know, treachery of translation problem. But I always tried to capture their words, but he was trying to say basically that if the, if the religion, if Islamic religion, it doesn't make people happy, there's something wrong. And there needs to be a dialogue needs to happen, because he was talking about Islam as being a very flexible religion that changes with the context. And that's why there are so many religious scholars that are trying to interpret the text. So, you know, he was interesting. Yeah, it was, it, was, it was good to go and visit with him. Um, okay, so Sidi Mumin Cultural Center. So Bukhar Maku Mazuz, oh, he's not in that. He started this cultural center in Sidi Mumin, which is outside of Casablanca. And Sidi Mumin is an area of about 350,000 or 450,000 people. And this cultural center is its shining jewel. Here's um, the sister city, Chicago, Casablanca, plaque that they have. Everyone was excited for our arrival. They did a big show for us with, um, you know, singing the Egyptian anthem, the United States anthem, the Moroccan anthem. All the parents in the community who have kids who participate in the programs at CD Movement were there to see them graduate. And, some of the Americans that were with our with our group, they have um, a lot of programs that help folks learn how to sew. And here are the cute kids singing, and there's the Karmaku Mazoos. They did a little rap dance for us. Okay, this is CD Movement. So CD Movement is basically a shanty town, as far as the eye can see. Did I do it? Hello? Yeah, okay. uh, somebody, uh, that top one out. I'll get it, I'll get it. Okay, so City Moomin is a town that has about 350 to 450,000 people. And I don't know if you remember the, the bombings in Rabat and Casablanca in 2003 and like 2007. There were about like, and there was like 14 youth in the one incident and 12 youth in the other incident, and they had suicide vests, bomb vests, and they blew up. Um, I don't know where in Rabat and Casablanca. Well, Moroccans learned that a lot of those youth came from Sidi Moumin, those shanty towns, and so what's Morocco doing about that? Well. Um, as soon as we get this up and running again, I hope to show you that there's this big movement to raise all of those shanty towns and to move people into government buildings that you may have seen some in the background of that picture that just went out. And those buildings, I mean, for lack of a better word, they're like public housing, you know. And um, from my understanding, the people Basically, when they move into an apartment, they're purchasing a mortgage that they pay off over 30 years. And the, our host told us that the town's having problems because people keep going back to the shanty town. And they keep raising the shanty town and building more buildings and people still build up these shanty towns. And it was the only time in my two week visit in Egypt and Morocco that I felt any hostility towards Americans or towards uh, visitors. We were in a big bus. I mean, it felt really voyeuristic that we were like looking out the bus windows at like the poverty. But we were going to Seating Women Cultural Center to see this program and, um, and we we're, were driving through and there were people on the streets giving me finger gestures through the window. You know, I was shocked because I had not seen any of that. In Egypt they were so happy to see us because their tourist industry is down the tubes and they're like, thank you so much for coming to Egypt and please go home and tell everyone to come and visit. Um, you know, CD movement obviously doesn't care about tourism because it's um, 
it's really poor. So one of the ways in which um, the Bukhar Mazuz tried to help out was by starting that cultural center, which again is a jewel in the city movement, but you know, it only houses so many students, and there's only so many students who get our, you know, get the benefits of that program, and I'm really not sure how else they're gonna tackle the problems there. Like elsewhere in the Arab world, the, um, the youth population in Morocco and in Egypt, they, there's no jobs. They, like, you know, Iran, Egypt, Morocco, I think a lot of these Arab countries, and as it's happening in the United States as well. Iran is not an Arab country. I'm, well, I know Iran's not an Arab country because I'm Iranian. <laughs> and if anyone knows Iran's not an Arab country, it's me, because um, I was born in Iran. But I guess I was trying to say, I guess I should have said Middle East country, but I just was thrown in um, Iran without saying Middle East, and I was stuck on Arab. But yeah, it's a Middle Eastern country. A lot of the countries in the Middle East, including the Arab countries and Iran, and perhaps others like Afghanistan and Turkey that are neither uh, Arab nor Iranian, um, there, there's a huge problem with um, underage unemployment. And one of the ways in which they're trying to tackle it, say, in CD Moomin, is some of those students who are educated through the cultural center. Um, you know, we, we drove through some areas where uh, manufacturing is happening, and, you know, Bukhar Mazuz is talking to the mayors and talking with the manufacturers to have the manufacturers host internships for the students so that they can learn skills. And I guess one of the barriers that he identified is that the companies say that they don't want to take on the students to give them this training because they fear the expectation will be that the students will then expect to be hired by those um, manufacturers, those um, corporations. And even, so like they're kind of negotiating how that model could be implemented without that promise you know, being, um, without the students really relying on a promise like that. So, oh, so anyway, that pretty much sums up the kind of the different themes that I wanted to share with you and some of the different um, comparisons and contrasts I wanted to share with you. I mean, I walked away thinking we're all so similar despite our differences and everyone wants very similar things and we want very similar freedoms even though we talk about those freedoms differently and over there one of the main obstacles I think to implementing democracy is the fact that the folks I talked to didn't want to didn't see how having Islamic law as part of the government, how that is a bad thing, and how that would impede upon progress or people's lives. And even though we would um, converse with them about our experiences here and how you know, the Bill of Rights protects minorities and minority beliefs, it's not so there to protect the majorities. Again, the experiment's different over there. There's not the kind of diversity in Egypt or Morocco that we have in the United States. In Egypt, people are allowed to build um, mosques and they're allowed to build churches and synagogues, just like in, in Morocco. You're not allowed to build another kind of house of, house of worship. It's got to be one of the al Hebrinic, Hebrinic, that kind of always handle that. <clears throat> um, it has to be one of those religions. So. They don't have the freedom of religion that we have here, for better or for worse. Um, um, so government doesn't tangle itself with religion by just deciding which religions are the legit religions and which religions are not the legit religions. Um, okay, so here we go. So you can kind of see stuck way back there. Those are people. So the depth here, like the slums, it's amazing. Here's one of those buildings that uh, they're moving people into. And you can see, I mean, they, all of these, they all have satellite dishes. It's hard to tell in this picture, but all of these have satellite dishes on them. 
and um, and just like over here. So, you know, the hostility that we saw there, I could just, you know, the, the images that they see on TV and the poverty that they're living in, I'd be, I'd be hostile too. So, um, that's my presentation. And may I take any questions and answers? Could you explain more fully why in Morocco people were moving out of the uh, government housing and into the slums? You know, I didn't really understand why. I think maybe they were not, they didn't like the terms of the contract, you know, to, to cause they had to pay like, like a monthly rent or mortgage. And then after 30 years, this is what was explained to me, by the way, so I can't vouch for it. But um, and after 30 years, then they can own that home. So in the in the shanty, they don't have they don't have a bill. I don't know. I don't know what people are doing for work. There were people milling in the streets. Most folks had. Uh, There's a lot of fruit carts, and people were selling fruit and vegetables. But I mean, you know, I'm sorry. Thank you. So I'm, I don't know it fully, but you know what? I mean, that CD movement's been written up in the New York Times and then The Economist, and there's a lot about it on the internet. You can probably read about it. <coughs> yes. What was your biggest surprise in Egypt, and what was your biggest surprise in Morocco? Look, I was so excited to go to Egypt. I've always wanted to go. I was so I felt so grateful that I had this opportunity, you know, to go um, and to be able to visit these institutions. I mean, people don't you don't get to do that as a tourist. So I was so so grateful to be there to see the the tourist sites too. But what was my greatest surprise? I guess I mean I knew it was going to be polluted and dirty and loud, but it was very polluted. <laughs> And dirty and loud, and um, and people and like you know people are suffering. I mean, people suffer in this country too, and we see in the streets of Chicago and everything. But it seems like more people are suffering there. Third world country. Well, we have Don, third, I mean, we have third world here. parts in our country. I would say, yeah. All right, we'll move to Don, Reggie, uh, Judy. Uh, Yes. Uh, uh, okay. So, uh, 
Okay. Whatever. All right, I got a question. I'll make it go ahead with my question. I just uh, did your organization um, receive money from the U.S. Department of State? The, so no, the money was um, a pass through grant, if you want to call it that, through the Citizen Bridges International, uh -huh. which is an organization in Chicago. And all of their funding was through U.S. State Department funding, because this is all they do, is host people from abroad. Um, I, we had visitors from Kazakhstan, Ukraine, Indonesia, Africa, like a lot of different countries in Africa. Um, and so they get, so they apply for the grant, and then they work with organizations in Chicago to, to match up the students, or not the students, the fellows, with the, so we didn't, so the only money I guess I got was, my trip was paid for. Uh -huh, by the State Department? By the State Department. Oh, okay. Okay. Yes. okay. Mm -hmm. The constant thing I heard about uh -huh. was the impact of technology on the Arab Spring. Oh, right. If any, what impact did you see of technology and what role did it play? You know, while we were there, we were really relying on the technology to kind of see what was unfolding in Tahrir Square at the anniversary. And another complication while we were there, which I did, forgot to mention, and I'll tell you now, is that week the court was going to decide whether the civilians in the case where 78 people at a soccer stadium were murdered because the police supposedly locked the doors and left the ultras which are the hooligans on each side. Uh, I don't know where the original <laughs> event was that um, that came that started this, but it may have been in Port Said because I know that it was the governorates on the on that on the east, Port Said, Ismailia, Suez, and another one. That um, while we were there, Morsi put uh, martial law in place because people were protesting in the streets, I and mean, that's where people were being killed because they were so upset that the civilians were given death sentences. And so while we were there, that decision was supposed to come out the day of the anniversary, or the day after the anniversary, and they postponed it the full 24 hours. But that got people out in the streets, I think, a little bit more than even their being upset about not getting the freedoms that they were promised and that they've been exercising, you know, in the last two years. Could you compare and contrast the attitudes of the men and the attitudes of the women toward the female officials from the United States? You know, the, the people that we interacted with yes. who had um, upper, you know, high education, university education and whatnot, <laughs> they seem to be much more acceptable and flexible, you know, like the women working in the same offices as men. Um, I mean, there's definitely the, the etiquette at the business place that the men and the women adhere to, and it's very formal, and it allows them to interact and that's it. So, um, and you know, I, we mentioned that there are changing gender roles and there is more of an acceptance of Egyptian women working outside of the household. And that woman that I um, had pointed out who does education uh, on human rights issues and healthcare issues, she, does, I don't know what her situation is, she has a child, she, she doesn't have a husband. I don't know if she's divorced or if her husband left for another lives in another country or what. But she's a fiery individual and I mean she was just it was really neat to see her doing the work that she that she does there. So, you know, she's an example of it's more accepted. But she's very active. She's on the board of that institution and um, and other institutions. So um, so things are changing over there, but again the elite or the, the folks who have more education and money, seem, that seems to be happening faster at that level. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, uh, if I understood Rob, you right, move over. Yeah, you uh, mentioned that the uh, Muslim uh, Brotherhood uh, is uh, not a political organization with a political agenda. But if I understand you right, 
understand it. When it was passed more than 70 years ago by a guy, or partly by a guy by the name of Hassan Albana, uh, did uh, one of the cornerstones of their platform include all of the predominantly Muslim countries going to Sharia, Quranic uh, law? Uh, and isn't that about the political agenda as uh, you can get? Well, I mean, there's one thing, I mean, there's advocating for reform, and then there's being political. So, they were never involved in the political realm as politicians. I mean, they did, and I, I'm not an expert on the Muslim Brotherhood by any sense, of, as you stretch of the imagination, it's just what I've learned from talking to individuals on this trip, and from what I've read. But, um, but yeah, I mean, a lot of the Arab world and countries like Islamic republics of um, uh, in Iran, not, not an Arab country, but the Islamic Republic, yeah, they want Sharia law to be part of the legal framework. And they don't see that as a, like an issue, because the majority, you know, the people I spoke with in Morocco, I spoke with several professors and um, people who work in the government, about separation of church and state. I had a very interesting conversation, and I told them in, in the States, I educate people about our First Amendment, and uh, one of those freedoms is separation of church and state, and it's, 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 it's very integral to our democracy. It protects minority beliefs, and it prevents the government from interfering with people's beliefs. They don't, I mean, that framework for them, why do we care if someone no one's going to interfere with their beliefs. We're the majority. Okay. They, there's no, there's no acceptance of the minority. So if you talk, you know, what about? Um, you know, they're talking about women's rights a little bit. So that's a big step. But you bring up to them, what about gay people? Yeah, we're not ready to talk about that. Well, you're talking about human rights, but you're not going to include everyone. You're going to exclude some parts of the population. So there's definite tensions in accepting minority rights. Uh, uh, Which was a tension I didn't explicitly mention earlier, but it was on my list. Uh, yeah, uh, what is, um, now that Egypt has a new regime, uh, what is their attitude toward Israel? Well, from what I've read, I, mean, I saw pictures of Morsi, I mean, Ahmadinejad from Iran visited Egypt for the first time in like 23 years or something like that. Um, and they were shaking hands, and I mean, that worries me because I don't want to see another Islamic Republic happening in our world. And I want Iran to not be an Islamic Republic. Um, so, I don't know what their relationship with Israel, but shaking hands with Ahmadinejad is not good. For their relationship with Israel. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. wow. okay. Have you ever heard of the work of the Albert Einstein Institute from Boston, particularly a publication by a gentleman by the name of Gene Sharp, his book From Dictatorship to Democracy, mm -hmm. and the Optor Training School, which was the backbone for the organizations? I have never heard of that, but I'd love to. I'll, I'll tell you about it later on. Okay. Yes, I believe you said. Uh huh. I believe you said you were born in Iran. I was. Uh, what year did you leave and under what circumstances? I left in 71. I was 11 months old. Sorry, sorry. My father had already been in this country. He was a doctor. And um, they planned on moving back to Iran after he. Because like in Iran, it was so uh, like you were so successful if you worked abroad for a while, and you came back with all those those credentials. Well, that changed. <laughs> wasn't wasn't so great if you had a Western education anymore. You know, they you know maybe put you to death for that. Um, so they wanted to return, and they couldn't because they didn't want to anymore because like took a 180 degree turn over there. Um, so yeah, it was a long time ago, 71. But I visited in 1999 and 2006 as an adult. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
Oh, yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, on your trip and the other trips like it, uh, other, other groups or, or whatnot, do you know if there was anyone who spoke Arabic? Well, so this is the thing. This is the first time that the U.S. State Department Bureau of Cultural, whatever the heck bureau it is that has this program, this is the first time they had a two-way exchange. They, usually it's just the one way. It's people from abroad coming to the United States. And, you know, they're doing an evaluation to see how successful this was in forging. So their, their purpose is to forge relationships among professionals who are doing parallel work in, in other in different countries so that they can support each other, share resources, learn from one another. It wasn't about us teaching them, it was about us learning from them, them learning from us, us teaching them, them teaching us. Um, in fact, when it comes to um, juvenile justice rights, for example. Is, is that a no? I'm sorry, I know I, dig I digress a lot. I is that a no? Um, was, was there anybody on the Oh, that spoke Arabic? Arabic? So no, the, question, okay. the answer to that is the only people who spoke Arabic were the Arabs. Well, no one, oh, let me take that back. There is a woman who worked at ICER, in Chicago ICER is the Illinois Coalition for Immigrant Refugee Rights. She is Palestinian. And she speaks Arabic. Her fellow was from Morocco, so I didn't spend the entire two weeks with her. But when I was in Morocco, she was there. All right, Peter. Yeah. Uh, how do you rate human rights in Iran as compared to uh, the Arab countries like Egypt? Well, the nice thing about Iran is. Women have practically all the rights that men have, other than like their testimony in court doesn't count as much and that kind of thing. But um, in terms of like being able to drive, where you can't drive in Saudi Arabia, right? Women can drive. Women hold jobs. They're in all the different fields. Um, it's not that's not controversial at all over there. Um, the fact that they have to cover up, I find that impressive. I don't like that. Um, the fact that they get hassled for like wearing nail polish or makeup, I don't like that either. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, it's not petty. Like their 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 the harassment there is just it, it it boils down to this like petty, to my my opinion, and in their opinion, it's like oh my gosh, these women are going to seduce the men, and the men aren't going to be able to like keep their pants on because the women are just like that. Ooh, so tantalizing. <laughs> but um so you know that's that's the issue that they're grappling with. I mean that's just that's crazy. There's poor people there, you know, it's just it's insane. So I don't like it any and I wish it would change. Okay. Uh, and the women in Iran are very for I'm happy I'm Iranian and not and then they come from a country where women are like indoors all the time. In Saudi Arabia. In Iran? Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's always this tug of war happening, but the youth over there, they have, I mean, they, they, they're they working the system. Yes. Um, I would say, well, so in, so in Morocco, they're so different. Morocco, Egypt hasn't been a monarchy since 1923. Morocco's still a monarchy. They've adopted a constitution, they're now a constitutional monarchy. The monarchy co-opted the movement, the February 20th movement. And they ceded some of the power, what have you, the people that they wanted, but the monarchy's still in control. So there's some frustration in Morocco around that, but Morocco has had 10 years of reform prior, I and mean, we talked about how Ina Chenna changed the, um, the uh, family code to make women have more rights. And Egypt hasn't caught up that way. But Egypt hasn't been a monarchy. The folks there, I mean, the people we met with, I mean, they've been, 
exercising their freedom for two years. People were, they've been talking about things in public that no one could ever talk about before. They're excited. I mean, but see, this is the problem. The same thing happened in Iran. In 79, I remember I was a kid both the Ayatollah came back from Iraq and, you know, just consolidated power. And it was like a, people weren't, it, was, it wasn't a religious republic yet. And um, everyone was exercising their freedoms, and I don't think people were prepared for the fact that it was going to be dangerous for me to meet them. And in Egypt, they're more wary about that because there's a model who's supposed to buy for that. And so the, the, the folks that went on this, the youth that we worked with, or the younger people who were part of this program who are forging. Um, these programs yes. over there, trying to implement changes and fighting for democratic laws. They're optimistic, but there's two camps. There's the Anwar Sadats who say, let's work with the Morsi, the gov gov like, duly elected government, and make changes within the system. And then there's everyone else who says, no, this is not what we asked for. We don't want Morsi. Look what he's already done. Welcome, honey. There's not, they're totally different. They're, they're totally different. Every country there has a completely different circumstance. Well, and Morocco was the first country to recognize the United States of America. So I guess Morocco and the U.S. have kind of a unique relationship with each other. And, um, and they're just a different kind of a country. Probably, I don't know. Of course. Probably, I don't know. Yeah, Mary, would you say in order to have human rights, you have to eliminate organized religion from your culture? <laughs> I'm not a fan, of per personally I'm not a fan of organized religion. I don't know if, I mean, I don't believe that organized religion is the only source of, like, persecution of human rights. So, it's not, a, but, um, but certainly they could do better. Yeah, in, uh, in these two countries where you're in Egypt and Morocco, you know, you know men could have more than one wife? And if so, because when they have more than one husband, they have that. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, so I know in Iran, you can't, so this is not an Arab country, but they're a Muslim country. And I know that you're allowed to have more than one wife. It's with the, with the, with the, with the uh, Quran says, and I haven't read it myself, but I know it says this. Everyone knows it says this. You can have more than one wife if you can support them. That's a big qualification there. People have trouble supporting the one family. So you can't just willy-nilly go and get wives because you have to be able to support them and the children that you get from them. So is it legal? I think it's legal. Um, I don't, but like in Egypt, like in Iran, you don't run into folks who have more than one wife because they can't afford it and, and it's not talked about. But my grandfather had more than one wife and I didn't know that until I was 15. I thought my, I thought one of my grandmas had died or got divorced and he remarried. And I was 15 and I heard everyone whispering to each other. I'm like, what are you guys whispering about? And I'm like, shh, we're talking about your grandfather. Now he had more than one wife. I was like, what? But um, no one would talk about it because it was taboo. No, because it was like a taboo subject because it's not that accepted. I mean, even though it's part of the culture, it's a little bit like they laugh about it. Well, I was just wondering, you said in Egypt there's a lot of women who are married, but they're living such a, their husband is someplace else working on exactly. something. That's exactly an issue, and that was why that woman was working on the health care laws to support those women to get health care in the absence of their husbands. Uh, I noticed that your earrings are in the form of a cross. Does that feel a problem? They're a flower. It's a four-petaled flower. <laughs> they were from like Peru or something. My friend got them for me. They're pretty. <laughs> it's a symbol. I don't know.
You can search for converts somewhere else, Brown. There's symbols everywhere. Where's the Oh, I believe you mentioned that the uh, somebody of the people in the both Egypt and Morocco uh, were yeah. wary of the fact that uh, Islamic law was working its way into the Constitution. They were concerned about that. Do you think that that's the, the case in the United States as well regarding Christianity? Oh, well, no. So, okay. So, the one fellow who I mentioned, Hassan, who I pointed out, who wrote this, he actually said, he, he admitted he's an atheist. Now, we persecute today atheists in our country and in the world for millennia, um, or however many years. Um, and now, atheists still get short shrift, you know, they, they're, they're uh, persecuted. Over there, oh my gosh, if you admit that you're atheist, I mean, so, <laughs> certainly, yeah, so. <laughs> hey, Frank. So Hassan, so he shared that with us. So he shared that with us um, privately, but uh, there isn't really a language for atheism, first of all. Then, so I'm, let me tell you about this. So in Morocco, we had a, 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 a conference. Several political science professors from different universities in Morocco presented about the 20th, the, the Arab Spring and particularly the 20th of uh, February movement in Morocco. And um, and they all took issue with calling this a revolution. They're like, this is not a revolution. They're like, Arabs don't know the meaning of the word revolution. These are uprisings. Revolution in the context of what the Western world knows, the Arab world doesn't know. That's, that's their, their premise. Um, and, um, oh my god, I'm forgetting what, you, what your original question was. About Christian religion, Christian religion imposing its religious beliefs on the government here. Oh, so, oh, so we had this breakout, so we had these breakout groups and, um, and some of the different, me so there were media, there were journalists at this conference, and there were people who worked at these programs, and we had these breakout groups. And I was in this breakout group where we were trying out a process for dialoguing where you actively listen and are thoughtful before you respond. And to, to try out this dialogue, we used the topic of separation of church and state. So it was me. An individual from the United States who works at the Council of American Islamic Relations, and so he's, he's, he's Muslim, and then three Moroccans, two women and a man. The man was a journalist, one woman was covered, the other woman wasn't. The other woman was from Rabat, and Rabat's kind of a unique place because their population hails from Spain. And. Um, what? So we're all sitting there, and the, the way you dialogue this is you say what your thoughts are about the topic. Everyone shares that. Then you go through what, um, uh, what like kind of um, questions you might have about the topic. And then the third is what scares you kind of, that worries you about even having this food. So I started off, because everyone's looking at me, I started off, I said, you know, I teach democracy in the United States. I talk about separation of church and state. It's integral to democracy. You have to allow people to believe what they want to believe and respect people's beliefs. The government has no right in interpreting belief systems. The only thing the government can do is, is gauge one's credibility and sincerity in upholding a certain belief system and all this. And they listened to me, and then the next person went and said, there was a woman who was co uh, covered, and she said, I don't see any problem with separating church and state. Um, the moral, I don't see how you can have morals without religion. And which, of course, whoa, you know, yes, you can have morals without religion. Um, and then, wait a minute. He don't believe in us. Well, and then, well, I guess, you know, religion's an amorphous concept, right? So, I guess you could, you could, so, 
<laughs> so, um, the man, he spoke, so everyone spoke English, but the man was talking to us via a translator. So I was watching him answer the question. And the question was posed, like separation of church and state, you know, what, what do you think? And he goes, in Arabic, he was talking, but he was saying basically, everything we have comes from God. And he was using this. So, like, if that's your premise, that everything we have comes from God, how do you separate church and state? You can't. I mean, that's, I mean, he didn't have a, a paradigm for there's different belief systems. And um, so he was talking about Sharia law and how it's valid and how it's not going to be a problem because everything comes from God. The, um, the woman who was from Rabat who was not covered, she also did not see any problem with separation of church and state. But this is like a predominantly Muslim country. I mean, their only diversity is they had, well, is that they had 200,000 Moroccan Jews that were a huge part of that culture that fled, not fled, but they left when Israel was formed. So they only, they only have 2,000 left of these Moroccan Jews. But I mean, that's their diversity. They have Jews and the Moroccans, the Muslim Moroccans. So that, that appreciation for minorities is something missing from the equation that is a barrier, I think, to democracy the way we know democracy. Now in the United States, we have huge problems with separation of church and state. People are fighting about Obamacare, you know, um, you know, should, how do we characterize a religious institution? Do they have to be primarily performing only religious tasks? Or is it 50% plus that they're doing religious and the secular aspect has to be less than 50%? before we're going to label them a religious institution. Um, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, other ways that the separation of church and state has re reared its ugly head. Well, Rob Sherman lost his Illinois case against the cross, the, uh, what was it, the Knob, Knob Hill cross, um, where some state taxes went to making sure that that cross was uh, stabilized or maintained. Um, last year, we brought out um, Jessica Alquist, who fought against her school district in Rhode Island because her school district, the school in the um, uh, administration, uh, no, in the uh, auditorium, had a prayer banner hanging there for 50 years with a mural on the wall that said, Heavenly Father, grant us this, help us this, and then, and as a freshman she saw it, as a sophomore she spoke out at school meetings about it, and the ACLU got complaints from other parents who were of other religious affiliations, and they threatened to sue, and when they identified Jessica as being the great plaintiff, because she goes to the school, and she has, she has to go to mandatory assemblies in that uh, assembly auditorium, she sued, and they won, because the school shouldn't have one prayer. If they had more than one prayer, the Supreme Court, like if they had a Muslim prayer, a Christian prayer, a Jewish prayer, and like a Buddhist prayer, the school probably, the, the, you know, the Supreme Court probably would have said that's okay. But it was, they, had, they only had the one. So, so we have problems here, definitely. But that's why we fight for the First Amendment. If we don't fight for it, who's going to fight for it? The government's not going to fight for our rights. So. Um, no, I think the U.S. government, that's for sure. No, they're not. The State Department, which you're affiliated with. No, I mean, they're the, you know, the Bill of Rights protects us from government regulation that can't, can't that cancels our rights. So, Not really. Yeah, the Red Squad, don't they? Okay, Brown. The Red Squad? Have you ever heard of that? No. CIA, FBI? I, I've heard of the CIA and FBI. Sure. I've heard of the Red Squad. Okay. Oh, uh, those are the questions. Okay. Um, I wonder, you mentioned briefly USAID. Uh, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about USAID and what it is. And oh, USAID. And what, what, what they do. You know, I, I, I don't know very well. I have a... I have a master's in public health, and so I was in that public health world, and I would 
I try to do international public health. My, I used to work at USAID and stuff, but oh, I don't for know, <laughs> not for them, but in conjunction with them to achieve goals of like um, improving child nutrition in, in Madagascar specifically, because that's where I was. Um, and I don't know that much about it. I don't, obviously, you know, there's political implications in the United States funds programs abroad, even when they're not political programs and they're social programs. So I don't know too much about, I know that the United States just gave Egypt like $250 million in aid. I don't know what that aid looks like. I don't know what proportion of that that's USAID, AID funds or what have you, but um, so I, I'm sorry I can't answer your question. The internet would probably be a better resource than I would be. Bye. Thanks for coming. Let's go to rebuttals, Brom. Uh, yeah. I think it's. Rebuttal. I think we, yeah. Rebuttal. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Rebutt me? What? What did I say that could possibly be Nothing. Rebutted. We just. Oh, we got to We got. We got to let you. You get the last word, so don't worry about it. Uh, the, uh, the lamb amongst the wolves. The perfect president. Yes. Uh, yeah. Let's thank our speaker. Let's thank our speaker. Make it five. We'll, we can shorten it later on. Well, some guys will be shorter. Uh, yeah. Some will be Everybody does take up a full five minutes. Oh, uh, my God. Let's see. Uh, uh, we try to use the size uh, around here. Uh, to, uh, oh, do I need to move so that people... ready to speak. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Oh, no problem. Yeah. All right. Let's get this a show on the road. You guys say it up. All right. Here's a... This is Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, we we are amongst uh, a lot of Christians here, and we saw the respect they have for the uh, lady speaker. They were uh, commenting, talking, exchanging ideas, laughing. Uh, that's not very respectful of a very professional presentation. Uh, I uh, have a very big dislike for organized religion and religions in general because I feel like humanity will not achieve a peaceful state until we get out of that state of mind of somebody who's coming and bring us everything. Uh, this is a world that evolved from, from, from life that formed at the beginning of the earth and then it uh, changes that haven't come because of uh, meteorites bombarding the earth, because of radiation inside the earth to keep it warm, uh, because we have a star that is at the right distance to keep the water in the temperature that it could be liquid or, or vapor. So maybe you drink too much, I think. No, she laughs. No. This is your personality. It's personality. <laughs> yeah, well, everybody should be happy. Yeah. So he's 
So anyway, that um, uh, we I come from uh, the southern part of Spain, and uh, if you read the story of the Arab world and the Jewish world and the, the Christian world, for 800 years, they have the most exciting, the most uh, scientific, uh, uh, advanced civilization uh, where people were respecting each other, loving each other. It was incredible, the achievements of that period. When the Catholic Church started producing the barbarisms that they did, there were many Spaniards that wrote song, songs about the, uh, remembering their uh, Moorish kings and their friends and their daughters and sons and how they played together and how they grew together and so on. And so many Jewish families have, have been lived, living out of countries for thousands of years and they have wonderful relationships. Uh, we know for sure that some Arabs families protected the Jewish families when these programs were were going through. So people are, uh, I think, good uh, in, 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 if you let them be good. But you introduce religion and you introduce a very divisive and very uh, unsustainable way of, of reasoning and to conduct society. So for that reason, when uh, people here, you know, just keep mentioning the Bible and mentioning the the goodness of the Bible and the lack of morality unless you have a religion, that is seems so stupid and so limited in the, uh, on, the, on the logic of the thing that we have to confront it every day. And another thing that we have to confront is the faith in technology. Some people are becoming more and more <laughs> unbelievers, but they put more of their belief into the goodness of technology to solve the problems that we are creating. And as we know, I mean, if you study any, 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 any little bit of what technology produces, is you push one thing here and another thing comes here. You push this out and this comes up here. There is no free lunch. What we extract from the earth and we were used and abused, we have to pay for it. And uh, that's, that's about as much as we can say about here. Next. I was, I was going to start by saying I don't need my whole five minutes, but now I have a little more um, after the, uh, the gentleman I'm directly following. Um, a year or three ago, uh, a, a professional hate monger made a great deal of hay out of a proposed Muslim community center in Lower Manhattan. And I, I tried to look into the whole thing to get some actual facts. And when I found out that the name of, of the institution was to be Cordoba House, um, I knew I was on their side because we remember Alondos very warmly. Um, I'd, I'd like to... Uh, in my opinion, correct a couple of facts. Um, the Muslim Brotherhood has been trying to take over Egypt for generations, and the brutal, dishonest aggression of the last year or so um, certainly uh, does not suggest that uh, uh, they have changed or, or moderated in their aims. Uh, the notion that the Muslim Brotherhood is not political uh, is I, I don't know, it's make-believe. Um, and incidentally, getting rid of Mubarak was not a revolution. Getting rid of Mubarak created the opportunity for a revolution. And that revolutionary possibility is still very much in question and, and very much in play. Um, I, don't follow Egypt in immediate detail. I, I'm not even sure what, what sources there would be, but uh, it's it's way, it's not at all clear who is really going to going to come out ahead. And uh, finally, a couple of people mentioned our homegrown Christianists, um, who are so parallel to the Islamists there. 
people who worship Christianity instead of Jesus, and people who worship Islam instead of God. Um, the Constitution of the United States, and this is not the Bill of Rights, this is the Constitution, Article 6, Paragraph 3. No religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under the United States. <coughs> Next. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, you made me think. Gender is important. Uh, here at the College of Complex, it's a little bit different than usual. But basically, this is a male institution. Yeah. It's perfectly okay here to, in your rebuttal, string four or five four-letter words together. Mm -hmm. That's perfectly okay. It's not okay at Jane Addams Senior Caucus. Jane Addams Senior Caucus is two-thirds women. It's not okay at the Second Unitarian Church of Chicago. Uh, we've got at least half women, and believe me, they are powerful at Second Unitarian Church. I've been in Morocco. I'm a bad observer. I've been in Morocco. I've been in Egypt. I was there actually when the revolution was happening. But I repeat, I'm a bad observer. But both of those countries, to me, are male countries. Yes. They don't really care about women. While we were at uh, Egypt, I felt no, I wasn't scared at all, and I'm a wimp. Uh, it was during the uh, revolution. So they, they flew us out, and they flew us to Istanbul. Big change. I didn't see many women over there in Istanbul. There was a woman, looked like the speaker, you know, Western. And she said, you can drink the water here. So I figured, hey, Turkey must not be much like Morocco and, and Egypt. It's more, at least there's some female part there where some women, and again, this lady was dressed, she could have walked in here and looked like part of this group. End of story. From approximately 800 A.D. or the current era, um, until uh, about 1490 or so, uh, Spain, the, the Spanish Peninsula, Iberian Peninsula, was the site of the greatest scientific achievements in the world. And uh, it was in Islam, it was a Muslim country in, uh, in, in that period. Uh, the, the great kings drove them out uh, across the Mediterranean into North Africa. And uh, of course they, they managed to screw up everything since then. Um, there was a thousand years between the establishment of Sharia law as uh, established by Mohammed and the founding of the United States. Uh, so there was a, a, an evolution of human culture in that thousand year period. So naturally there's going to be a difference in terms. In 1776, it was a new concept of democracy in the world. So we had, we had a real situation there. Um, I, as, as to the effect of uh, Christianity on the laws of the United States, um, one of the most recent examples, which was yesterday, at the, in the Illinois State Legislature, the, uh, a coalition of black ministers uh, threatened reprisals against black representatives and black senators if they voted for the Gay Marriage Act in, this, in, the, uh, in Illinois, and thus it was defeated. Um, one other thing, referring back to the period in Spain uh, when the uh, Islamic center of science was there, uh, in the city of Cordoba there is a mosque that is so huge and so beautiful when the Catholic kings uh, took over Spain, <clears throat> they built a huge cathedral in the middle 
of this mosque. It, it, it's incredible. It, the, the cathedral is tall, but it's dwarfed by the enormous size of the mosque. Okay. Women are key to any revolution. Any revolution that, that has ever happened in the world, women have been in the thick of it. The revolution against the Tsar, the, the February Revolution in Russia, was started on International Women's Day. The women workers went on strike, and all the other workers came out on strike, and then the workers without any organization at all, really, but spontaneously overthrew the Tsar. The Tsar was uh, the monarch of a backward country, like Egypt is a, is a third world country. Russia was, a, a, was not an advanced country. So you have to remember that here, like in Morocco or Egypt, or in uh, where first where the Arab Revolution started in um, Tunisia, the theory of permanent revolution applies. First formulated by Marx and, and expanded on by Trotsky. What it says is in these countries where the bourgeois revolution has never been finished, then when the bourgeois revolution does happen against U.S. imperialism, that's why the people of Morocco hated you so much, because their poverty is caused by U.S. businesses and U.S. military bases that keep the king in power, U.S. money, U.S. weapons that keep the king in power and keep them in poverty or in a uh, crummy condo deal. They can't afford those condos, and they're stuck in their shanty. But, the thing is that the, the revolution in a third world country tends to, not every time, but it tends to grow over into the socialist revolution. It tends to continue. That's what it means, the theory of permanent revolution. And uh, in these countries, you know, the U.S. didn't give a hang about Mubarak. They didn't give a hang about Anwar Sadat. All they care about is that the, the money, yeah, all they care about is that the comprador bourgeoisie, that is the local capitalists who are beholden to U.S. imperialism and the U.S. corporations continue control. And they're perfectly happy to have, the U.S. is perfectly happy to have the Muslim Brotherhood in power. I, I assure you the State Department is not upset about uh, the Muslim Brotherhood uh, and they, they certainly are, n are no friends of women's liberation. No matter what they may tell you, no matter what they may tell you, they may use uh, different movements for their own purposes. You know, they use the uh, movement in, in Iran against the Shah. They, they were able to subvert it and put and put uh, Khomeini, Khomeini got in power and Khomeini crushed the unions, crushed the left, killed all the socialists, uh, literally. I mean, I had, I had friends who were Iranian Tarantis who went back after the revolution. We never saw them again. They were put down in cellars and shot. This is what happens when the revolution in the third world country does not grow over. This is what happens when it does not grow over to the socialist revolution. It stops midway somewhere. And that's where the situation in Egypt right now is that the revolution is, is blocked by the regime. It's blocked by the regime. Or in Morocco, it's co-opted by the regime. So that, you know, getting rid of Mubarak was nothing. <laughs> Mubarak was just a tin horn dictator that the U.S. employed to run Egypt. When British imperialism was running Egypt, who did they use? They had a king. The last one was King Farouk. Remember him? He got overthrown by uh, uh, Nasser, who was a revolutionary nationalist. And when they got rid of Nasser, then they had their puppet in him, Anwar Sadat.
regard to the comments that were made that it was Christians who kept interrupting, well, I would say to that that the person who contributed the loudest interruptions is the Trotskyite, and therefore an about um, atheist. Not necessarily. Well, One maybe so. Time. But nevertheless, no personal it was certainly not. It was certainly not. No personal fact. Charlie, one fool at a time. No, no personal fact. But in any case, it was not. It was not necessarily Christians who were interrupting. And I find it ironic that as a Jew, I should have to make this comment, since the Christian religion does not usually defend need defending, and certainly not by me. Um. I, I enjoyed your presentation very much, but I thought I heard you say that the last Egyptian king left office in 1923. No, 1952, when Muhammad Naqib and Kamal Abdel Nasser overthrew King Farouk. That's what I just said, Farouk, King Farouk. That's when the Egyptian revolution was. Was 53, not 23? 52. Oh, 52? Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, second, with regard to the comments that were made about how the U.S. doesn't care about the Muslim Brotherhood being in power and so on, the hell they don't. Um, they like it. No, they do not. <laughs> One fall at a time. And if you insist on interrupting there's room for two. No, there's not. And if you interrupt me again, I'm going to tell you that in more blunt language. <laughs> Sit down here and be quiet. How do you shut up, too? No, you had your chance when you were up here. So? So what? One fool at a time. Now, as I was saying, the U.S. government most certainly does care of the Muslim Brotherhood, who are regarded in Washington as a bunch of troublemakers. A um, bunch of troublemakers. They do care about that. They like Sadat and, and Hosni Mubarak because from the U.S. point of view, they kept order and stability in Egypt and kept things quiet. Now, Mubarak, I grant you, was a crook. Uh, Sadat, on the contrary, was loved in Egypt because even if he was making money or whatever, he also brought medical care to the people and he also did his best to improve the lives of the Egyptian people, something which Mubarak didn't necessarily do. Now, I grant you that I might not necessarily approve of all of Anwar Sadat's methods of doing that. But he did what he felt was appropriate for his time and place and for his culture. Egypt is in the United States and vice versa. And his trip to, to, to Jerusalem took a lot of courage and he was a spokesman for peace. And as usually happens... It's not your turn, sir. Not it's not either. your turn. It's not your turn either. It's not your turn. It's not your turn. You know, you, you, you are all cheating now. now. It's not no. your turn and you have to accept that. All right. That. It's not your turn either. Well, Just yeah. go on. Fuck Thank with you. that. Not my turn. It's not his turn. Thank you, everybody. It's Dave Zucker's turn. Go on. Please all be quiet. Thank you. It took considerable courage and what usually happens to the people who speak up for peace in this world, including John and Robert Kennedy and Martin Luther King, whose assassinations I happen to live through, um, as well as Anwar Sadat. Well, that's what happened to President Sadat. And there was considerable anger in the Egyptian population as a result of his murder. They did not look kind of the people who did Thank you. I'm not, interested, I'm not interested in your far right left wing kook views. I don't want to say All right, I would like to do my rebuttal. What's kooky? Uh, oh, yeah. Shut up! Hey! Not him! This guy's not going to stop! All right. Uh, well, at any rate, my uh, rebuttal tends to be very focused. I would like to discuss the fact that there isn't any kind of uh, sort of terminology for unwed, uh, unmarried mothers in Islam, and that's because in general, for the most part, there aren't any. They're usually murdered by their families, or they commit suicide, or they flee somewhere if they have the means to do that or are sent somewhere by their families if their families have the means and the willingness to do that because of that 
really stupid idea of honor of the family being upheld by the women, and if women um, are not virgins when they're married, that honor is besmirched in the only way that it can be socially um, polished up again is with the woman is murdered by her brothers usually, or her father. So, and actually, in a sense, this all, all this Abrahamic religion, this, this was, uh, women are not unimportant. Women do, in fact, matter a great deal in all social structures in the world because you wouldn't have any of the next generation without women, in case anybody needs to know that. And um, the, so, so what the problem is, is that the, the place of women in patriarchal religions, of which the uh, Middle Eastern Abrahamic religions are certainly uh, the epitome of, the, the, their position has to be very proscribed by the patriarchal structures so that, um, we, so that we know for sure that their um, offspring are in fact the offspring of the men that they've identified as the father of their children. So this whole thing has really resulted in one flavor or another, one degree or another of oppression of women. And this murder of women who were not virgins was not restricted to uh, Muslim religion. It was in fact practiced here many years ago. And this kind of um, social sanction against uh, women who for one reason or another were pregnant without benefit of papers um, was really very severely was enforced by the society. Not so much among working class or poor people, but cer certainly among um, people with property. And specifically because of the, of the economic value of um, the, the economic value that having the sons represented to the uh, father. So all of this really results in, um, all, all of this resulted in, in a lot of oppression of women. and. And I guess um, you avoided that mentioning that women were murdered and still are being murdered there. Would you please be quiet? You sound like the marriage. Um, and um, at any rate, so that um, I suppose you were trying to avoid that mentioning that, but that really is a, an ex a one form that that takes, and it, 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 it takes those kinds of oppressive forms that here in the Christian religion, and um, certainly in the Jewish religion, in Judaism, and, and most assuredly in Islam. Hey, first off, uh, in addition to having the opportunity to meet uh, Chuck up close and personal at next week's book fair, you will also have an opportunity at 3 o'clock next Saturday uh, to uh, be at a book signing uh, where I will be signing copies for purchase uh, of my uh, book, uh, The uh, Hidden History of Ravenswood and Lakefield. Uh, so uh, that uh, has been out since uh, the week of March 17th. Uh, sales are not bad. And uh, I have already signed a contract for a similar book uh, on uh, Edgewater Uptown. Uh, okay, moving on, just as a point of order, could we behave ourselves when any of the other speakers are speaking? This is not the British Parliament. <laughs> they, 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 they behave that way there. Even the Irish Parliament does not behave that way. Uh, the members of the Doyle go across the street uh, to a pub right across from the Hall of uh, Parliament. There they do their arguing, uh, like honest ladies and gentlemen, uh, in the pub, but they do not let it interfere with government business. Moving on, um, subject came up about the varying degrees of church and state, or mosque and state, or temple and, sta and state. I hope regardless of who we are, what we believe, that none of us 
ever has to live under a regime where church and state are one. It is not good for the church. It is not good for the state. Um, in, the, in the United States, we had cases of various states virtually becoming arms of certain churches. For example, the Constitution may have said that there was no religious test for holding public office or voting or anything like that. And yet, up until the 1820s, in several New England states, nonconformists and Catholics were barred from holding certain public offices and even voting in certain states. You know, and that was under the U.S. Constitution. They didn't get around to changing it at the state level. In Israel, correct me if I'm wrong, but I understand that initially the only form of Judaism that was officially recognized was Orthodox Judaism. That's correct. Still, still is. is that still true today? Yes, it now, is. what about course, reform? Jesus. What about conservative? What about Reconstructionists? Uh, you know, they're, they're, then, they're then not recognized as full-fledged Jews in the land of Judaism. In Islamic countries... Shut up and quit feeding his ego. In Islamic countries, you have case after case after case of where mosque and state are one. And it's not good for the mosque and it's not good for the state. In England, the state religion is still the Anglican Church. And that's, you know, there's nothing wrong with the Anglican Church. However, well, it's not good for the Anglican Church. It's supported solely by the state. And if you walk into an Anglican Church on a typical <coughs> weekday, or even on a Sunday, you will find it's only half full. They have forgotten how to seek out new members. Consequently, it's the ones that go there out of habit because their grandfathers did, and they know they don't have to put too much in the collection box because uh, the Chancellor of the Exchequer will take care of all that when it becomes uh, budget time uh, in, uh, in Parliament. Point of the matter is that this is a lot more complicated and yet a lot more simple than we may realize. Oh, and incidentally, those are not crosses and those are not flowers you have. From here they look like shamrocks. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm wondering, how long have you been one of us? <laughs> anyway, I think my time is up. And uh, uh, thank you. Good evening. Uh, in my opinion, uh, revolutions and coups are caused mostly by poverty. Uh, the uh, people in the Middle East, in most all of the countries, if not all of the countries, were um, very poorly treated, the, uh, and they lived in poverty. The uh, people, um, the rich people, the, the big shots, the ones that ran the thing, people like Saddam Hussein and so forth, uh, what do you have, six palaces, and uh, his uh, sons could go out and rape women and uh, with impunity uh, because that uh, daddy was the leader of the country and so forth. Uh, and uh, it seemed that um, Saddam Hussein just thought he could keep getting away with anything until it finally came down to a point where he had to be stopped. And uh, that applies. I mean, the, what really touched this thing off, I'm told that Facebook uh, caused a revolution in about six countries in the Middle East. However, uh, I, however, I want to say that uh, that uh, it started, I understand, with a gentleman in Tunisia who was selling apples and couldn't feed his family, and an inspector or some government official came and filled up a bag of apples and took them and didn't pay anything, and this meant that this man now would not be able to feed his family that day because of what happened. And he, the man was at the end of his rope financially, and so he 
burned himself up with an accelerant as a protest against it all. And this touched off the revolution in Tunisia. But this man, I don't know what his name is, but he did not die in vain because the people made revolution in Tunisia. And then it spilled over into, I think, Bahrain, and then into Egypt, and in all these other countries. And I think that when the people in the Middle East, in, in these countries, have a more of a say in their government, and that the oil wealth is more uh, evenly divided so that the people make a good living and have food on their tables, that they won't think about uh, Islam uh, taking over the world. They'll be very happy having what they have and living good and so forth, and uh, the, the, the nightmares of the Middle East will be behind of them. And I look very forward to that time. Uh, and I'd like to ask the speaker and her friend to please excuse those who heckle and uh, make, they kind of profane the whole thing. Thank you very much. Many of you guys seem to have forgotten a little bit about what I had spoken about a few weeks ago here, about what really happened in the uh, Middle Eastern revolutions, and that these revolutions were planned out, that they were coordinated by several groups, and that there have been some international organizations behind them, based on a lot on the philosophy of a gentleman by the name of Gene Sharp, who runs something called the Albert Einstein Institute in Boston, Massachusetts, who wrote a book called From Dictatorship to Democracy, and largely propagated by a gentleman out of Serbia by the name of uh, Igor Popovich, who basically took Gene Sharp's work and used it to overthrow some of the Eastern regimes in um, the former Soviet colonies of Eastern Europe. If you want to look at the work that Optor does, that Sergei Popovich runs, he uses a fist, a clenched fist, behind him. And if you look at that clenched fist, you'll see variants of it all over the Middle East, all over the things like against Hugo Chavez. And that is sort of the trademark that Sergei Popovich and his revolutionary consultants do by going around the world. Their whole basic philosophy is not to knock down the government, but to simply co-opt the, the elements of power to not to sustain the corrupting power forces, but to actually change that it's in the best interest of the, some of the elites of the country to change the government to something else. Now, I agree, it almost seems spontaneous that these revolutions all of a sudden had propagated out of nowhere, but it's only because there have been a lot of people for all, well over 10 years getting the, the seeds of, of nonviolent protest into, into the hands of various organizations around the world. Now, if you don't believe me, you can go on YouTube and, and check and... and, and, and and Google and check a lot of this out because all of their revolutionary literature is available online. And if you want to learn more about it, you can refer to an earlier College of Complexes episode where I went into this in great detail. To make a long story start, folks, revolution is globalizing, just like a lot of other things have globalized. Ideas, civil rights, human connections are all beginning to be done on a worldwide scale. And like it or not, what happens in one country happens in another. The other thing you also have to realize is that the demographics of the Middle East are much like they were in our 1960s here in the U.S., where there was a lot more young people than older people. We were in the midst of our baby boom revolution, and the largest crowd of people were in there at that time. And we had our Summer of Love, we had Woodstock, we had our civil rights movements, we had everything else, a systematic series of reforms when we had a lot more young people than older establishment people in the mid-60s. 
I believe uh, some of those forces, too, are at work in the Middle East. Now, as far as solutions or, or problems are concerned, what usually happens after a revolution, a true revolution, is that if the countries don't get themselves together, it usually involves some form of dictatorship. Look at the difference between the United States Revolution and what we did afterward, where we had, you know, the, the, Ar the Articles of Confederation, then we actually had a constitution and a, an open debate with the Federalist Papers, versus what happened in France under Robespierre. Those two models have been in there, and what we wound up with was George Washington becoming first president of the United States, which I believe the big single most patriotic act was him retiring as his generalship and going back to the farm and then coming in to public office on the will of the people. He could have been dictator of the United States. Versus Robespierre and their French revolutions where Napoleon finally came in to unify the country. Many people, nature abhors a vacuum. And if a revolution takes out somebody else, I think in Egypt what's really happening is that the Muslim Brotherhood and this Islamic uh, this Islamic fundamentalism may take up and result in a worse dictatorship than what we what was there before. We've already seen it happen in Iran. And furthermore, it is imperative that if we really want democracy around the world, we must encourage it. We must remember that it's not just revolution that causes change. It's what happens afterwards. It's what we call nation building. Something the United States is not good at, but a lot of those other European countries are. With aid, with other items. In short, I really believe the solution to these problems is more globalization, more interconnectedness around the world, and more communications. And I think we're going to see, in the next hundred years, a more prosperous and a more peaceful world. Thank you. All right. Let's see. Thank you very much. Very good presentation. Let's thank our speaker again. All right. Before I begin, this I got to refute the previous speaker who <laughs> just informed us that somehow George Washington was going to become king of the United States, which is absolute nonsense. And I highly recommend you come on June 29th to really get some depth of history so you don't perpetuate these nonsensical things like this that 25,000 men died and women to get rid of the king and we were going to choose another one. He barely could keep up on the office of being the general of the army. He's lucky he was able to keep that job, and yet somehow he was going to become king, which is singularly amazing to me. <laughs> but you seem to think that he was, it was a matter of him whether accepting it or not, which isn't the case. Uh, but anyhow, let's get on to the topic tonight. I really didn't know we were going to focus too much. Actually, on two of my favorite topics, human rights and religion antithetical subjects. Um, where's Butler? He was talking about something about what's not good for the church and not good for... Religion isn't much good for... If it isn't much good for the state, I always got to wonder what makes you think you religion is good then for the individual? What, what is its proper place? Um, if you're going to take... Here's the thing you, you're dealing with. Then I'm going to help you out out here a little bit. Yeah, you know, what do you know about Rob Sherman, by the way? <laughs> he, he, I, I know Rob, and he used to be here all the time. But um, if you take the Judeo-Christian and Muslim religions, you have a hierarchical, a hierarchical worldview. And you're going to take that worldview, and it's given by the deity, it's prescribed by God, and you're going to take this framework and you're going to impose it on your family and on all of society. Now, if Jews. you want to, if yeah, all three religions are the same, Judeo-Christian and Muslim, 
are all hierarchical. If you want to post that framework on society, <laughs> then you're going to have some conflicts because you're going to show up and say, well, there's emphasis on human rights. Human rights is a concept that came about only in the Enlightenment. You're not going to find it in, in the scriptures or the written documents of these religions. Or the Quran. It's just not there. It hadn't. If you look at the intellectual history, it's not going to be there. Um, so you come along and you've got a real problem here because you have the two world views. You have your more contemporary enlightenment views of human rights and equality, and you've got the other one, if you want to call it religion, which has a totally different one. Uh, the thing that I saw this, now getting together and having your assemblies and so forth, forming your organizations and things like that, but you're a lawyer, and I can assure you, these people are not going to have any rights that they cannot codify, they are not codified into law. And that's what I was looking to hear. Were there, were there any actions? Perhaps they were trying to change this. Now, to one extent, I have to agree with Dave that some of these occasions, I'm going to be eclectic as I always am, are somewhat <laughs> economical in basis. However, I think people have a great deal of endurance for poverty. They also have a great deal of endurance for inequality and injustice. But there's some other things I've discovered if you study some of the reason where change comes in revolutions. It somewhat would be like, though, I would phrase it this way. If you're unable to provide for your own, and I think the one that they really look at as a variable is that the next generation will not have a better world than the parents have. And that's what kicks off situations here. If you want, there's no horizon. Or if it's a negative one, that one will say, then then this, we better do something about this. Um, I have to compliment you. I haven't sunk a lot of psychic energy in the status of women over the years, but I began thinking about it tonight. Some of the things that I heard were um, un really not right regarding the status that half the population has to put up with. Uh, the, you know, I know it's a topic that's been covered the cross and the sword is going over there, but um, really um, anything that can be done in that regard, you know, it's not going to be easy. That's what I mean. They don't look upon it as oppression. I ask, like, like my Muslim friend, he says, well, that's just people, women, acting decently. You want them to be decent, right? You, know, you don't want them to be like, you know, you know, running around, girl, running around, blue. Yeah, well, you know, what's wrong? You have a few little rules, you know. So anyhow, yeah, but uh, whether or not it's economic or political for change, I don't have an understanding here. I, whether they I would just kick it out a bad guy, you know, where they, now if it looks like they were looking for some real social change, it's not easy. The other thing I was going to say, um, and there's another correction I'm going to make historically, well, regarding the American Revolution and the French Revolution, both had revolutions, however the United States ended up with a, an economic hierarchy, one percent had as much wealth as the other 99, and I think the French ended up with a nice little socialist arrangement, which I find a bit more positive and appealing. So thank you very much, come again when you got another one. Next one, you're, you're up. <laughs> I rise to a point of information. Uh, I've only been to maybe a dozen of these, yeah, but I very quickly learned that uh, it gets really repetitive regardless of the subject. Uh, uh, people get up here and flock their personal manias and theories and worldviews and emotional fixations. Um, but my, one of mine is, is factuality. 
Um, Judeo-Christian is make-believe. There is no such thing. Christianity is a cultural appropriation of some of Judaism by the Hellenes who really didn't understand what it was at all and went off their own way with it and it's had all kinds of accretion since. Uh, Judaism in the Torah counts a total of 613 commandments incumbent on the Jews that cover all of life, from your fabric to, the, to your roof. Of those 613 commandments, Judaism is of the, has the teaching, is of the opinion that seven apply to non-Jews. No incest, no eating meat torn from a living animal, a couple of things like that. Judaism very explicitly is about and for the Jews, not for everybody else. Islam is, as has been under discussion this evening a little bit, is very explicit that it's universal. Uh, as far as I know, and I am certainly no scholar, most of the versions of Christianity claim to be universal. Judaism is not. There's no, Go, there's no doubt. Live and be well, be decent, and uh, if you want to be a Jew, don't. It's, it, it's, it's a headache. <laughs> Be a Jew, but not a Zionist. Wait a minute. There's a God that is only for the Jews. Be a Jew, but not a Zionist. If you knew what you were talking about, you'd still be a fool. A fool. Uh, There's only a so God. Zionist. Zionist. Yeah. What's the point of the Jews? Zionist. 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 When it is pointed out that there were two rules, okay, no personal attacks. Hello, my name is Ray. Okay, uh, I think that one thing on the West Side should be careful and uh, emphasized. One of the things that we've been doing a lot in the neighborhood is just following the situation with this. Okay, going on you and I should like, uh, Tim's in charge. You know, immigration, the other two of, uh, you know, like the election. Uh, okay, okay. I mean, okay. I think Chavez is okay. so cool. What I wanted to say is that, uh, you know, oil really is, is, the, is, is probably the major factor of all this you know, turmoil that's going on in the Middle East. We can talk about, you know, church and state and, you know, so forth, you know. We'd be here till, you know, four o'clock. But the real issue really is oil. And I think uh, I haven't heard really anybody say anything about, about that. The reason why I, I, uh, I brought this up was because I followed a lot of the situation that was going on in Venezuela. When uh, <clears throat> our identity John, when he went to um, when he went to uh, Venezuela to greet Chavez and so forth, they had they had uh, they had you know two things in common. Okay. One of course was oil, and the other one was what took place when Chavez uh, when it was a coup. People forget that uh, Iran had a coup uh, in Mossadegh. I think you know some of you know who he is, uh, and uh, so they had a lot in common because one of the things that happened is that uh, people forget is that when he was over, uh, that is the coup in Venezuela, which lasted only maybe just a couple of days. The United States right away you know, recognized it. Right away. Just like what happened in Ecuador. Right away they went to recognize it. That's, and that says a lot. That says an awful lot. One of the things is that the United States 
Well, let's, well, let's put it this way. There's a, there's a, there's a, 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 a term, a, a, a common term uh, that's often used, but people really don't really think a lot about it, and that's called Amer American interest. American interest is a very generic term, but it can be anything from oil to peanut butter. The United States, after the fall, after the uh, uh, after the defeat of the British, after the Second World War, there was a, there was a vacuum, and that vacuum was filled, you know, by the United States. And the United States, as it is, you know, as after the war, you know, we all know what happened. There was this great industrial thing, you know, uh, the economy was doing great and so forth, until finally, you know, the computer came. I think that the computer, the internet has created a lot of what is happening today, all over the world, all over the world. Even the poorest countries, for example, you can go to some remote places in Latin America, you can go to some of the remote you know, villages, okay? And you'll see people with the internet, and and that and 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 you know some of these people, they're so poor, yet they have an internet and they can communicate, okay, far places that they never dreamed of, okay. Now, what does this mean? It means that now they can communicate and, and, uh, and talk to each other about all the oppression you know, that is going on in Latin America and in the Middle East. Um, Latin America is, uh, is, a, is an example okay, of what happened <clears throat> or what's happening in the Middle East. You know, the United States, as you know, after the Second World War, as, as, especially in the 50s and then of course in the 80s, okay, there was a lot of oppression, okay, a lot of oppression, okay. Then came along other dictators, okay, all right. I'll cut it short right here. But anyhow, what I want to, uh, uh, you know, finish is that uh, all these other issues, uh, to me, I, I, I consider them, you know, I, I don't know if I want to use the word minor, but uh, the, 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 to me, uh, you know, they're not important. What's really important, what's happening right now, especially right now in Syria, in Syria right now, because it is not a war, it's not a civil war, it's actually a proxy war between the, between the former Soviet Union and the United States. You know, that's what it is. The United States wants to keep the hegemony, and if they could find some way, and I think they will, if they could find some way to overthrow, okay, Iran, Regime change. They'll have they'll have that whole Middle East, you know, sewed up. Thank you. All right. Yeah, the U.S. imperialism. The U.S. imperialism. Well, that's you can uh, Where to begin? Uh, Jesus. The, uh, Jesus. You want to begin with Jesus? Yeah, yes. yeah, we need that. Jesus uh, had uh, 12 close friends. He organized them and asked them to go out to uh, the various other little towns and villages and uh, uh, communities in, uh, in Galilee uh, to uh, uh, speak about God's rule in their society. Now, God's rule, uh, they had come under God's rule and it had changed their lives. So some of them had been baptized by John the Baptist. That meant that they confessed that they were sinners. They knew their Mosaic law, and they knew that they had offended 
and that they were falling short of what God wanted for them. Uh, a consciousness of what God wants for us is a very important. Uh, uh, Christians, if I don't know any denomination of uh, uh, Christians who do not realize that they fall short of what God wants them to do and be. Uh, and that means that they uh, do a, a certain amount of uh, what are sometimes called charitable works. Now those get uh, stylized uh, into putting a, a certain amount of money in the, in the place uh, that is passed uh, in, in uh, churches and uh, in uh, uh, Islamic uh, societies. Uh, alms uh, are given and there are it becomes institutionalized. Uh, in Hebrew uh, Judaic society uh, uh, institutionalizes it too. Uh, but you know, when when you try to do good yourself and get involved with people, and you find like as you did uh, that. Uh, women are, uh, and families are, are broken up because uh, uh, someone is not seen to be uh, legally married or, or uh, under the uh, uh, dominance of a proper man uh, who uh, would be capable of, of Ruling the family, my God, what patriarchalism has done. Uh, well, uh, I, I want to bring this uh, to a close pretty soon so that our speaker can... Uh, I, I will say that, uh, that congregationalism, which was the dominant uh, religion uh, in uh, the New England states, except for Connecticut, which was Presbyterian, uh, had a certain amount of democracy, as did uh, the, the, uh, even the uh, English parishes. Uh, they were reformed uh, English uh, uh, parishes, and they uh, uh, did have lay control uh, so that clericalism was not uh, the uh, dominant uh, rule in the United okay. States or colonies. Six minutes. That's a good yes. point. Get, okay. Uh, enough. And, uh, Speaker gets the last word. Yeah. Speaker gets the last word. Okay, hello. So thanks for all your comments. Uh, very interesting. I just wanted to comment on a few things. So, um, I, I, you know, we were talking about social media, and I digress, and I forget what the question was. But yeah, social media we really depended on while we were in Egypt and Morocco to figure out what was happening on the ground. And you may have heard that there were a lot of rapes and just assaults on women in Tahrir Square. And I mean, that's nothing new in any kind of conflict. There's rapes and sexual assaults to, as a weapon of war, or as a weapon of um, keeping a protest down, or what have you. So the main way that we learned about that was through social media, and of course that was very tragic. Um, and you know, Sharif, the one individual from uh, Egypt who, who visited with our center the first round in 2011, he said that when he had never really been to a protest before, and when they were 
organizing these protests on social media, we, I mean, they were shocked at the numbers that showed up in Tahrir Square. I mean, you know, he expected like a hundred people and like thousands showed up the first one and subsequently. So, I mean, he was shocked and he shared that with us. Um, one of the really palpable lessons I've learned from this visit was just how lucky I am in the United States to do the work that I get to do without fear of death threats or fear of, you know, harm to myself or my family members. Um, I mean, there have been people in Egypt who have died for being activists and they've been um, detained and never heard from again in the last couple of years. And I really respect the colleagues of mine who are doing this work in Egypt and Morocco who are doing it under scary situations. Um, I don't have that. Even though, yes, we have our fair share of criticism of hate, hate mongers and, and, and what have you, it's just it's not the same. Um, with uh, bringing something really close to home with respect to separation of church and state or respect for church by the government, respect for religion, um, in DuPage County recently, DuPage County was trying to pass some text amendments to their zoning code so that no places of assembly could be built anymore in unincorporated residential areas of DuPage County, which are areas in which churches do like, or churches or other places of worship do like to build for various reasons because there's populate, there's you know re resident, residential areas there, it's close to where people live, newer, um, members of the community are moving into and close to where they live. And essentially, even though the text amendment was written in a broad manner to include all places of assembly so that they could potentially bypass any kind of constitutional um, uh, challenge, it affected mostly incoming populations, meaning mosques, people who worship at mosques. And so in DuPage County, you've been seeing a lot of backlash towards mosques that want to be built. Um, the, the, the court found against DuPage County's actions with respect to at least one mosque in DuPage County just last this few months ago. Um, and so that, that mosque intends to make the county pay for every dollar that they used to try to defend this lawsuit or to fight this lawsuit against a situation that shouldn't exactly happen. And our organization actually was very instrumental in trying to fight against these text amendments because places of assembly, it's not just places of religion or places of worship, that includes a lot of different places where people like to congregate, including places like our center. So we were a stakeholder in that, um, in that uh, situation so that we spoke out saying this isn't right, not just for places of assembly, obviously, for places of worship, but for the broader, um, you know, places of assembly for social purposes, for eternal purposes, for civic purposes, and the like. Um, so, in any event, thank you so much for showing up. I really appreciate it. Um, you all make this work worthwhile. I appreciate your your interest and your um, listening skills and your rebuttals. I learned a lot from all of you. I hope you learned something from what I had to share tonight, and I hope to visit with you all again. Okay, sometime. give us again your website and how somebody oh. can get a hold of you. Citizen Advocacy Center, that's citizen singular, advocacycenter.org. Citizenadvocacycenter.org. Go to our website. Our phone number is there. I'm a staff person there. My email address is there. And check us out. All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. All right, Tim, listen, Dave and I...